You thought we were done? Not a chance. Welcome back team. The auditorium doors are open. Take your seats. Let's jump in. Today we're diving right into steel connection design. We're actually going to talk about tension connections, uh, chapter D in the AISC steel manual. So let's dive head first into a brand new example because we're back, baby. See you in there. Select an eight inch W shape ASTM A992, that's the grade of steel, to carry a dead load of 30 kips and a live load of 90 kips in tension. Keynote there, tension. The member is 25 feet long. Verify the member strength by both LRFD and ASD with the bolted end connection shown. Verify that the member satisfies the recommended slenderness limit. Holy shoot, what? Assume that connection limit states do not govern. All right, well, that's pretty helpful. So this is a steel tension example. That means we're gonna grab our tab, because we all got our tabs, and we're gonna be heading over to chapter D. That's in the back, and that is all about the design of members for tension. I mean, that's the title right there. That's where we're gonna to wanna to be. There's only like four pages within this chapter. So design of steel and tension, uh, there's not a lot to it. It's pretty straightforward, but there's a couple of gimmicks that are a little strange. And that's where this example is really gonna make things clear and make you a lot more sound with the design of steel members in tension. One thing that we're gonna to do to simplify this problem is we're actually gonna cut it in half. So we today, we're gonna to go red, we are not gonna be solving for ASD application. Let's just do it for LRFD. First thing, let's factor our loads. Uh, we have dead load equaling 30 kips and a live load equaling 90 kips. Without getting too far into all the different combinations per chapter two of ASC 716, uh, I know off the bat that I believe 1.2 dead load plus 1.6 live load is gonna be our controlling case. That's what it is most of the time, but if you have something weird, always go back and check to make sure that you are using the governing load combination. What does that get us? Plug it in 1.2, 30 plus 1.6 of 90 gets us 180 kips. That is our demand. So now we need to check all of our failure modes and determine which one is governing. Okay, so in the 14th edition Maroon Steel Manual, you're gonna go to page 16.1-26. I have it over here next to me, so I'm gonna be glancing back and forth. I'm not doing the visual on the screen today, so just follow along to my beautiful voice, okay? And we're gonna go down to section D2, tensile strength. And what you'll notice is one of our first uh, limit states is tensile yielding. All right, so you scroll down here. And that is just the following equation as shown of phi, because we're using LRFD, PN equals AG FY. AG is our gross area of our section of our wide flange. And then F sub Y is our minimum yield stress, okay? And for our wide flange to determine our uh, material properties, we're gonna go to table 2-4 in the steel manual. And you are going to see that typical wide flanges is A992 steel, which they did state in the problem, and that has a minimum yield stress, F sub Y, equal to 50 KSI, and something else we're gonna need, FU, our minimum tensile stress of 65 KSI. AG is the gross area of our cross section of our wide flange, and that we can find in table 1-1 at the beginning of our steel manual. That's where you have all the sizes and shapes. We're gonna to go to, you know what? Uh, we need to specify a size. So we need an eight inch W shape. So that's a W8 as I've specified here, but we need to kind of determine some size. Let's try a W8 by 21. I'm gonna use that for this. Hopefully it works. We're gonna go through until it doesn't, and then we might have to size up. Let's see. So for a W8 by 21, AG per table 1-1 is 6.16 inches squared. We have everything we need to solve our first uh, failure mode, which is tensile yielding. So phi for this case is equal to 0 0.9. That's specified right in chapter D with that equation, very straightforward. So phi PN equals 0 0.9 6.16 inches squared. 
and a Fy 50 KSI. We have KSI, kips per square inch. We have inches squared. That's going to get us, and phi is just uh, unitless. So that's going to give us a result of kips. That equals 277.2 kips, which is greater than our demand, which is what we need to design for, of 180 kips. So we are okay in this limit state, so we're fine. Next, in section D2 of chapter D, we have what's called tensile rupture. Tensile rupture is per the equation shown, which is phi, Pn, equals Fu, Ae. You might be asking, what is Ae? Well, if you go over to section D3, just one page later in the book, you will see that Ae is equal to An times U. U is our shear lag factor. And that is defined in section D3.1 in the commentary. An is our net area of our cross section of our member. Ae is our effective net area. So how much we can actually utilize based on the connection type that we have and a couple other odds and ends based on this chapter. So let's very quickly jump over to D3.1 in the commentary because I do want to define what that shear lag factor is so that we're all following along. Now for all of you, and again, sorry I'm using the book today, not the digital version. See the gray section right here? See everything else is white and then this is gray? That is your commentary section, all right? So if we flip over to that, and the commentary section is laid out just like the chapters. So we were in chapter D before, now we need to go to the commentary section D, because that aligns with chapter D, makes sense? So chapter D is page 16.1-282, all right? That looks a little something like that. So what is shear lag? Shear lag is a concept used to account for uneven shear distribution of connected sections, where some, but not all, of their elements, i.e. flange, web, leg, etc., based on your shape, are connected. So if you have a wide flange section, but you're only connecting you know, the flange, the top flange and the bottom flange with plates and a bolt connection, kind of like this example, you're not engaging the web of the member for tensile stresses, so there's some type of reduction that's happening in the overall capacity of the member. And this can be applied to every other type of shape for the most part, based on varying uh, principles that are defined in this book. All right, let's jump back to chapter D, not the commentary. Let's continue solving this puppy. So we need to find the effective net area. That also means we need to find A sub N, the net area, and U, our shear lag factor. Let's start with our shear lag factor. So if we flip to the next page, boom, this is 16.1, dash 28. Here you have this table, and this provides numerous different cases, all listed on the side there, one through like 12 or something, and it's based upon the type of section and connection that you have in tension. Well, first of all, it starts with case one, but I like to start with case zero. And you're like, case zero, I don't see that anywhere. Well, if you flip back to the previous page, let's write down case zero, you will notice in section D3 that uh, there's a slight passage here. And it says, for open cross sections, such as W sections um, and a bunch of other ones, the shear lag factor U need not be less than the ratio of the gross area of the connected elements to the member gross area. This provision does not apply to closed sections, such as HSS sections, nor to plates. Well, we have a wide flange, so that does apply to us. And you're like, I don't understand what you just said right there. Well, let me describe it and show you via the example, okay? U needs to be greater, can be greater than or equal to the area of the connected sections over the gross area of the member. The area of the connected section, if we face, hopefully it doesn't block this off again, scroll up, is we know a bolted section on both flanges, those are our bolts. This is just a cross section at those bolts. So that means, and we don't know what it's connecting to. Most likely it would be like plates or something, 
but the only pieces of our cross section that are getting connected are our flanges. So that means the area of the connected section is the area of the two flanges of the wide flange, okay? So area connected equals two, because there's top flange and a bottom flange, times the width of the flange, B sub F, times the thickness of the flange, T sub F, divided by A sub G. Well, A sub G we know from above 6.16 inches squared, B sub F and T sub F are per table 1-1 back at the beginning of your manual. B sub F, which is the width of the wide flange, is 5.27 inches, and the thickness of the flanges are 0.4 inches. Plug all that in, and that all comes out to 0.684. So that is the minimum U. So everything else needs to be greater than or equal to this minimum U. We could just say min of 0 0.684. So if there's any other case that we're going to check where for some reason it dumps us lower than this value, we get to use this value based on this case zero in section D3. All right, let's keep going. So that's our first U that we've solved for. If we flip to the next page and we go to that table, we need to look at all the cases and determine which ones apply to us for this example. Case two applies to us. If you read the passage in the table, you'll see why. Case two is the equation 